Hello and welcome to the Quora and Discussion Q&A. That didn't make any sense what I just said. Hello and welcome to the Quora and Discussion Q&A. There are a lot of questions. A lot of questions. So let's just get right into it. I'll try to answer as many. Oh, hello. So much for jumping into it. You wanna say hello? You wanna do a Q&A? What's your favorite season of Legend of Korra? Season two? Get out of here. Anyway, Timo says, I'd like your opinion on the maturing of ideas from the last airbender to Korra. One thing I really appreciate about Korra's theme is I really like Korra's journey in season four, as a lot of people talked about and as I've talked about before. It's rare that we get to see heroes go into that kind of space with that amount of depth and also seeing the journey out of it and seeing that growth and development for characters is not linear. Like people can go back and forth in between modes of being and like modes of thinking and levels of mental health. Max Picard says, ranking of all villains. Oh my God. I always think these are gonna be easy videos and then I read the questions and I'm like, Jeez. If we're counting her as a villain, I'm gonna put Azula at my top. I just love Azula. I think she's so interesting and she's evil in a way that is so bad and so dark, but also so lovable. It's weird. It's really hard to pull off that kind of nuance in a character, I think. So Azula really is very, very high on my list. Then second place is very, very close between Zaheer and Amon. It would be Zaheer, but one thing that makes me kind of lose points for him, I think, is that his version of anarchy is sort of a caricature of anarchy. It doesn't go quite deep enough for me. Whereas Aman, his rhetoric is so believable because first of all, as I spoke about during the series, it's so effective when you appeal to the heart, when you're trying to gain support. I think that spoke to something that for me is very real about politics and about amassing power. But also it, it was understandable how he reached that. And it also, it showed very clearly that his motivation wasn't really equality. He was motivated by something much deeper and much darker. And so I thought that was really interesting. So I'm gonna give it to Aman by like a hair. Just the hair. Then I'm gonna say Kuvira, just because I just finished the comics and Kuvira was really cool and I and her rise to power felt felt natural, felt realistic. I like that she had some redemption. I like how her redemption taught Korra something. I think that served a really cool function. And then for me, it's sort of everyone else. Uh, oh, and the Earth Queen is my most hated villain. Armani Livell says, do you prefer there be one main antagonist with a few smaller ones, like in The Last Airbender, or do you prefer each book has its own antagonist? I just prefer that the villains are good, that their stories are compelling, that they are human, that they have human traits. And I think there are good examples of both of these in both formats. Like my feeling for Ozai wasn't really for him. It was more like ending the destruction, ending the war. But then like I had a lot of feeling for Aman, you know, and I had a lot of feeling for Azula. So it really depends more on the storytelling, I think. Mimi Alcapara asks, what personal lessons or meaning did you derive from the Legend of Korra that differed from The Last Airbender? But one thing I think that Legend of Korra did really well or focused on more than The Last Airbender is the meaning of pain in, in defining who you are. Aang's struggle is that he is being called to do something that is not natural to him and that he doesn't necessarily want to do. The beautiful resolution to that is he's able to do it and rise to the challenge in a way that is himself and does not compromise his own values and that's a beautiful thing. With Legend of Korra, it's sort of the flip side of that. Like Korra is somebody who only wants to be the Avatar. What she doesn't understand is that her life is going to be defined by the challenges that she takes on. Each time Korra reaches up to be the Avatar, to rise to the challenge, something about life knocks her back down. Each time she has to reflect and grow and then meet the new challenge as a better person. And I think that's such a beautiful metaphor for life. Korra to me is heroic because she rises through that each time. As a person who enjoyed and found value in both series, why do you think there is so much division and tension from fans of the original series towards Korra? Ah, uh, this is true. Like a lot of people told me not to watch Legend of Korra, right? I think it's probably a handful of things. One is everyone sort of has intuited, it made the big mistake of being after The Last Airbender. I think that there's something weird about fan fan connection, right? Like when fans are really attached to a show, there can be this mistake of making it about you. People form identities around the show. And so new shows changing things in a way is like a personal attack. I think the challenge and also the responsibility of the viewer in, in this show and any show is going into it with an open heart and not making it about you, making it initially about the story that they want to tell and doing your best to sort of meet it halfway. And I feel like Korra wasn't met halfway by many people. Another thing I can think of is the tone is sort of jarring in season one, I had to admit. Like everything's modernized. There's a very distinct period to it, which maybe rub people the wrong way. Korra takes a while to get to know. The longer the show goes on, the more Korra shines because she sort of starts out with a lot of qualities that many would consider negative. Like she's rash, she's impulsive. For me, that's not a bad thing because to me it's honest, you know, and that's something that I can relate to very strongly as someone who's often brash and impulsive. I hear you. I, I offered you the chance to be part of the Q&A. You said no. S Ninja Studios asks, are there any characters that you wish were explored more in the show? All of them. <laughs> I mean, all of them. I just want to spend more time with them. But in terms of like really not getting screen time, my instinct is to sort of just let it be and say that I think 
they were covered well. Like, Asami didn't get a lot of screen time, but then again, I feel like I have a pretty good feeling about who Asami is, and I think it's because she's just good, you know, like, we can see that she's a great person, and she's really tolerant, and she's very open-minded, and we, we get that sense even with the limited screen time that she has. Really, the only big one in my mind is Iki. Iki, I feel like, kind of got shafted on the screen time and the development. She really has, like, the one or two episodes where she's featured heavily. Kingsley asks, which characters in Korra do you most relate to? What do you think made them so accessible and appealing to you? First instinct, I'm gonna say Tenzin. As a kid, I lucked into a very amazing experience. That sort of set a tone for my life where I felt like there was a lot of pressure on me. Looking back, it was a lot of self-imposed pressure. It was like my thinking that I have to live up to this amazing image. And over time, I've had to sort of let go of that. That, you know, I'm not gonna be necessarily what I thought I was gonna be and that I can be something even better, which is something more authentic. Also, this is obvious, but I relate to Korra a lot. And I really, I really like her depiction of hitting a low and climbing back out of it. That was very meaningful to me. What made them so accessible and appealing? It's just that they're living lives, you know, they're, they're living people. They're not perfect, they can't solve every problem, they're often wrong, and they all have things that they're working on. You know, they all, you look at them, they all have obvious flaws, but you forgive them for their flaws because you know exactly where they are and you know you also have those flaws. And so you can immediately connect with them and you want to see them overcome it because seeing them overcome it is inspiration for, for you yourself to overcome it. And that's such a wonderful thing. It's such a rare quality. Super Nico 95 asks, which character or story point would you have liked to know more of in the Avatar universe? This is probably too obvious, but I want to know what happens next. I want to see the next Avatar. I feel like there are certain things that have been building through the journey of each consecutive avatar where each one creates a problem for the next. And I feel like an inevitable result of that, there's gonna be a conclusion maybe. Like there's gonna be a point where the avatar actually isn't needed, where the problems originally started by Juan have come to resolution. It does seem like there's sort of this development of the group to the individual in the show. And interestingly, I think that mirrors a lot of Western thought. And so I, I think there's a lot you could do with that. Which character in both shows is more like you? Which avatar is more like you? So I think the character I relate to most is Toph. I've gotten a lot better about this over time, but my natural disposition is to be really stubborn, really independent, and not want to feel like anybody ever has any degree of control over me whatsoever. I heavily resist any kind of cat categorization. Like, I get upset when people want to put me into boxes and tell me who I am or what I think. I don't want to live based on convention. I want to make my own way. I also have a tendency to be a little bit harsh or insensitive in conversations. Not because I have any meanness, just because it's just my way of expression. But mostly I just want to be left alone. <laughs> I am a very social person and I love having my friends around me, but I... I kind of want to be left alone when it comes to making choices. Which avatar is more like you? I'm definitely more Korra. I'm very ambitious, and my ambition leads to meltdowns. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Which city place in the Avatar universe would you live in? Zalfo seems cool. It seems modern. It seems artsy. What's your favorite subbending? Ooh. Flying. Gotta go with flying, right? That was so awesome. Release your earthly tether. Metal bending, probably close second. Just because of the way it's introduced with Toph. Just such an amazing moment. Thrax Stormbringer asks, who is the better avatar or just character in terms of accomplishment? Korra or Aang? I think Korra did more, but I think Aang did something bigger. Does that make sense? Korra has an incredibly long resume, but Aang did like this one big thing that was so sorely needed for like a hundred years, right? So I'll give it to Aang there. Dairain asks, how would you rank villains and their ideologies? Zaheer is definitely compelling to me, and I think a lot of that is not actually Zaheer, but Guru Lahima. I love Guru Lahima's philosophy. I think the idea of letting go is such a beautiful thing, and it applies so heavily to the show, because a lot of the character's struggles are the struggles to let go. So I thought that was a really cool thing. At the root of it, I think a lot of the villain's motivation is really just power, you know? Like Amon, for whatever he said about equality, he was looking for power. Kuvira, for whatever she said about you know, writing the Earth Kingdom, she was also looking for power. Ozai looking for power. Um, Unalak looking for power. So here is sort of like the, the odd one out because he's not looking for power. Sort of. Favorite character and least favorite character of Legend of Korra. Oh, uh, oof. Killing me. There were no characters I can think of that I didn't like, with the exception of the Earth Queen, who I hate, but that's sort of like a love to hate kind of thing. Favorite character, not counting Toph, I gotta give it to Bolin. Bolin was an endless source of enjoyment for me, but it's really close. I mean, I love all of them. Did you enjoy the fact we got to see the crew as adults, or did you prefer the gang where they ranged from 12 to 16? Actually, I kind of like the adult theme. I don't think it really ultimately matters because both of the themes are relatable and adult and mature, you know? But just being an adult, something about that, it's fun to watch adults. Did you like the fact that Korra had a larger recurring cast than The Last Airbender? Or did you think the writers bit off more than they could chew? Both, both. I mean, they definitely did bite off more than they can chew. There were just way too many people to give them all a lot of screen time. But it was also something really nice. It was nice that, you know, sometimes you get Lin, and sometimes you get Tenzin, sometimes you get Suyin. Not only is he here, but the Red Lotus, which add something special. You know, there's there's a lot to it. I think that the only negative of it is just like a lack of time. But for me, that's not a huge fault. It's something great. 
that I like them that much that I want to see more of them. What's your opinion on people calling Korra a Mary Sue? I'm, you know, I'm honestly not even sure what a Mary Sue means. Like a hero who can do anything? I should look that up. What's a Mary Sue? A type of female character who is depicted as unrealistically f lacking in flaws or weaknesses. Have you seen Legend of Korra? <laughs> no. She has a lot of flaws. And they, they went out of their way to depict these flaws and her growth among them. So, no, she's not a Mary Sue. I thought it meant that she's, like, overpowered from the beginning. And that may have some truth, but I think that's that's by design. It's not a weakness in writing. It's because you're supposed to think that and then she's set up to fail because her power and strength is not enough. There's a lot more to it. And she has to learn to be more mature and to understand the, the massive complexities of life, as do we all. Do you think Avatar will eventually lose its importance and become a relic of the past? I think this is heavily hinted in Korra. And this is something that I actually appreciate. People have different feelings about this and I can understand both points of view because the story has to start somewhere and some things you just have to take for granted. But just as someone who's like really, really actively thinking about these things, in the first series, the Avatar was sort of something I couldn't talk about because it's just something that exists and there, there's no real larger meaning to it. But I think Korra has sort of shown a light on that a little bit. It's like, well, this is something that arose from Juan, who did his best at the time to make a choice, and that choice, which might have been a mistake even, began humanity. And I think that's interesting. That's an interesting way of looking at progress over time, and it gives the Avatar a connection to life and society and human progress. And so I think there is a suggestion that over time, people will learn to live without the Avatar. People will no longer need the help of the gods. In many ways, the story of Avatar is the story of humanity and like emerging from small animalistic beings and tribes to nations, to interwoven societies where your tribe doesn't matter as much. And in some ways, that's part of Korra's struggle. It's like, what, what good am I now? It seems like in many ways, the show is suggesting that it's going to fall onto people to take care of themselves eventually. Do you think the Tenzin Korra dynamic was trying to emulate the Irozuka one and do you think it fell short? I never thought of the comparison. I think there are similarities just in the sense that it's mentor-pupil, but I think the Tenzin Korra dynamic is in, very, is in many ways its own thing. One of the reasons is I think that Tenzin has his own struggle, which is interesting. Like Tenzin and Korra is sort of a symbiotic relationship, whereas Iroh and Zuko, Iroh is sort of, you know, he's an actualized human being. He has pain, right? Like he's suffering from the loss of his son still, but it seems like in many ways he's already come to terms with who he is and who he wants to be. And so for me, it has a different tone. Also with Iroh Zuko, I feel like Iroh, as much help as he gave to Zuko, I think a lot of Zuko's growth can be attributed to his experience as an individual alone. And Iroh is sort of there waiting for him at the end to reconcile, which is really beautiful. Tenzin and Korra, I feel like they needed each other. You know, I feel like they helped each other grow. They watched each other struggle. KJ Goana asks, putting aside the absolute outpouring of hatred for Legend of Korra, there were a lot of Mako haters. What do you make of that? I didn't know there was this hatred for Mako. Mako was not a very interesting character to me at first. One thing that really turned him around for me is, was the short Republic City Hustle. It kind of clicked for me the idea that he had been dealt a bad hand. And the lesson that he internalized was that it's up to him to shoulder the burden for both him and Bolin. And that leads to him being overly serious and taking on things that are maybe not his responsibility. This is just a total guess, but maybe the reason why people didn't like Mako at first is because he's just such an obvious choice as a love interest at first. He's like strong, handsome, talented. It's like, where's the flaw? But he definitely does have them. And I think while it wasn't explored in super depth, like... We didn't really see a Mako journey. I feel like there was one happening subtly. Comparing him from the beginning of the series to the end of the series, I think there's a lot of growth there. And I really love how he ends up supporting Korra as a friend. I think that was really cool. The awkward love triangle definitely didn't help. Josiah Peterson asks a hard-hitting question. Which one, which show do you like more? I know this is unsatisfying, but I really can't choose. And I also don't think it's good to choose right now because I've just finished Korra. And so I'm, I'm emotionally raw to Korra at the moment. I think that just structurally and in terms of coherence, I think that The Last Airbender packs more punch, and that's probably just because of the struggles they had with Korra and the fact that they didn't know it was going to be four seasons. Better storytelling and character exploration? The Last Airbender is pretty stacked. You know, Zuko, Iroh, Azula are some of my favorite characters of all time. Just trying to give objective tallies, I think The Last Airbender takes it. Lockwood asks, given the opportunity, would you drop everything and become Barrack's full-time assistant? Hell no. <laughs> like, I'm not into foot rubs. Partner? Partner would be cool. No, I wouldn't do that either. Barrack's one of those people you trust but don't trust, you know what I mean? I'd be in his mover. Lily asks, what would you say to the people who told you not to watch Korra? What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> First of all, don't tell me what to do, all right? I'll do what I want. Secondly, I'd say to each their own. You know, if people really watched it with an open heart and didn't like it, there's nothing I can say about that. You know, everyone's opinion is different. Everyone's going to experience media differently. There are flaws in Korra, and for some people, um, those flaws may have been too much, and that's, that's fine. I have no issue with that. But I would say if you haven't finished it, 
or if you're basing your opinion on these like analysis videos that say it's terrible, then I'd say give it a second chance if it interests you. If not, then you know, it is what it is. From your perspective, why is the series called Legend of Korra? What did Korra do that was legendary in your eyes? Well, I mean, she's the, the first avatar of the new cycle. She opened up the spirit world to humans. She saved humans from 10,000 years of agony. You know, she did a lot. Like I said, Korra has a very extensive resume. Paul asks, this might be controversial, but referencing claims I've seen on the internet, would people have been more tolerant of Korra as a character if she were, were male? You know, I've seen this as a theory, and I'm sure there are some people who actually feel that way, but like just my, my gut feeling about it, as a viewer is that I don't think that's really an issue. I think there are a lot of celebrated female characters. You know, if anything, maybe you can say that Korra is not accepted as a female character because she doesn't match expectations of what a female character should be. That is possible. I think it's possible that some people are just put off by Korra because honestly, her character is a little bit rough in the beginning and in season two, I'd say even. And it takes something extra as a person to see that this is part of the design and that part of that is going to be her growth. But I think that a lot of people who want fully formed heroes right out of the gate, like Goku, you know, are going to have a hard time getting into Legend of Korra and might stop at season one or two. Francesca White asks, what is one thing Legend of Korra you actually preferred to The Last Airbender? Music, animation, overall, like, you know, throughout, so good in Korra, so amazing. They gave their all to just about every action sequence there is in the show. So I really, really appreciate that. Iron Luke 2001 says, what's your opinion on Korra and Mako's friendship and how it developed through the series? Amazing. It's so rare you get to see that, right? You get to see like from romance to awkwardness to actual deep friendly connection. That's amazing. What do you think of the similarities between Korra's and Zuko's journeys? There obviously are a lot of parallels between the two. They're both struggling to live through the pressures of self-identification. You know, I'm this thing or I need to do this thing to be accepted or to be happy. And they both have to confront reality and, and redefine themselves in ways that are, that are more wholesome, more authentic. One way they're different is that Zuko has sort of been forced into this thinking. And in a way, Zuko's struggle is the conflict between his mother and his father and him just wanting to be loved. Korra is more something that she adopted for herself. What's your opinion on Kuvira? I like Kuvira a lot, but I think she wasn't explored enough. And Part of that was probably logistical issues with the show and budget cuts and all that stuff. What do you think of the new Korra novel trilogy that's coming soon? I didn't... Oh, the... I didn't know there was a new novel trilogy. That's exciting. What do you think of the theories that Varric is actually Sokka's son and theories that Su Fung's father actually is Sokka? I've heard the theories and they seem valid, but it could also... It could just as easily not be the case. And it's not something that's deeply interesting or personal to me just because... You know, it is what it is. The characters are great no matter what. One thing that Suyin being Sokka's daughter would add is that Toph was always in love with Sokka, at least to some degree, so that would be cool. Digital Milan asks, if you were in charge of another sequel or prequel to Avatar, what would your idea be? So first of all, it would definitely be sequel just because I will I'll always take a sequel over a prequel, but I think just following the lineage of the show, one thing that needs to be addressed is the spirit world that still hasn't been addressed and what meaning that has for humans and also the end of the Avatar. I think that would be cool to see. Have you any thoughts on the criticism that Aang and Sokka were whitewashed in Legend of Korra? I hadn't thought about the idea that they were whitewashed necessarily, but it does seem like the creators were sort of selective in how they used Asian elements. They take names from Korean and Chinese and I guess Japanese, but they don't always stick to the phonetics. So I get the characters' names wrong all the time. You know what did bother me is in the last Airbender movie, we go to the Water Tribe, right? And we see Sokka and Katara just as white as the pure snow, but then they're surrounded by their relatives who are all like Native American or Inuit. That's to me what whitewashing is. Like everybody here is like actually a native tribe, but the two principal characters with speaking lines are just, are the whitest characters imaginable. That to me was offensive. But in a cartoon where they're not actually the things that they're, they're referenced by, um, it doesn't really bother me so much. If you were given the chance to change one thing about Korra, is there anything you would change? I think maybe a season two being more thematically coherent about Rava and Vatu, I think would have gone a long way. It would have made that season more enjoyable for me. Is there anything from Last Airbender you missed in Legend of Korra? Yeah, I think one one thing that greatly enhances the experience of The Last Airbender is that feeling of journeying through the world, and Korra is sort of all over the place with that. And if I have to guess, I think that's actually a major strike against it for most people when they watch season one, is because, oh, now we're just in Republic City. And Republic City is not... There's nothing, like, intrinsically appealing about it, and it's very much a period thing. I love the feeling in The Last Airbender of, like, we're just a small ragtag crew on Appa, and we're going around the world doing a whole bunch of shenanigans. We're going to all the different nations, right? I think that was a really cool thing. What kind of relationship do you think Aang and Korra would have had if their past lives hadn't been severed? Um, probably a really good one. I feel like they would have gotten along really well. Partly because Aang's just such a good guy, you know? Utd Benjay says, Korra is amazing. What is something you love that remained consistent through the entire show? So I think my favorite thing about this is that even though they didn't know that 
there were going to be four seasons, they still somehow found a way to make each season create the next season and create context for the whole thing. And so what you end up with is actually like a journey of the world through different modes of thought. So I think that was really cool. And it's amazing that they managed to do damage control in that way to make it so excellent. I also think pretty much all the characters have some sort of journey that feels great by the end. Even characters whose journeys don't get a lot of screen time, like Mako, feel like better people by the end. James Berry says, dude, dude right back at you. Diapresia asks, if you could remove the age restriction, how would you change the story? Would you make it more violent? You know, I wouldn't change very much. I don't think you necessarily need violence or sexuality or anything like that to make a show mature. I think the times where it can be a bit of a stretch or impair the story is when there's like a war or like there's massive destruction and, you know, no one gets hurt. That's one common issue people have with the last Korra comic, right? Is that like Kuvira just kind of gets off with house arrest and it's sort of a light punishment. And it sort of makes sense for the show just because like, well, I guess no one died. But in real life, these things have massive consequences and it's harder to forgive those kinds of things, right? Also, I'd say actually, like, all things considered, Korra is kind of violent. The Earth Queen's death, famously, is, pr is pretty gruesome. Katara killed those girls in Tales of Ba Sing Se, you know. There's death. There's death. I think it's a nice balance. If you had to try and write a Korra haiku, how would you do it? First five syllables, then next seven syllables, and then back to five. Haikus are quite hard. I'd try and make it good, but I might just fail. <laughs> Cody Zoom says, you get to spend a full week in the Avatar universe. Which nations are you going to, and what hotspots from the show are you seeing? So I'm going to base the answer on my real life. I'd probably be born in Republic City. And then I wouldn't travel, I would go and live in as many of the nations as possible, starting with the Fire Nation, and then moving to the Earth Kingdom. That's sort of how my life has gone. If they ever make another Avatar series, and what time would you like it to take place in? I guess just like the next one. The next, whoever the next Avatar is, whatever time they live in, is fine. Oh, maybe the future? That'd be cool. <laughs> A-E-I-O-U, A-E-I-O-U asks, who was your favorite character and why was it Varric? Um, it was Varric, and because he Varric so well. Jazzler asks, if you could rate Korra's growth, how much would you rate it out of 10? Um, 9. I can't give it a 10 because no one's journey is ever complete. Tropica asks, did you like beginnings? Many people say it ruins the mystery or the lore. I felt the opposite. As I mentioned a little bit already, um, I kind of wanted it. I understand why people don't like it, and I understand why people wouldn't necessarily need that. It just depends on your lens and what you're interested in developing. And for me, I was interested in developing the history of the Avatar and the deeper meaning of the Avatar, because I'm always looking for what meaning I can apply to myself or to things in my life that I know, such as society in the world. So I appreciated it. I think it added something nice. I would not take issue with anyone saying they didn't like it. It really just depends where you draw that line for yourself. Who's your favorite out of the Airbender kids? Oof, hard-hitting questions, Gay Ninja. Rohan, no, I'm just kidding. I think I would have said Janora at some point, but I think Janora, she kind of just becomes a vehicle for plot at points, I'm I'm realizing now. I didn't really have a strong feeling for Janora in later seasons. Milo scares the hell out of me. Am I going to say Iki? That's sort of unexpected, but that's sort of what I'm feeling right now. I ended up loving Iki. I got in trouble because I, you know, I mentioned Janora and Milo as being ready to fight or, the, you know, them being able to do a lot of damage in the fight. And people came down on me for that. Like, what about Iki? That's not it at all. I mean, I love Iki. Iki was never really a battler. The, her only moment in battle that I can remember is her saving Milo. Or, no, her saving Janora. In your opinion, why do you think people hated Rava and Batu but not Aang and Ozai? You know, one thing I don't like about them is I don't like how inconsistent they are in, in their symbolism and themes. It's like, what are we supposed to take from them? What are we supposed to learn about humanity from them? Chaos and Order m was cool, and they sort of almost got there, but then didn't, and like referred to Vatu as bad, you know? So I think it's that kind of thematic inconsistency that's a problem for me. Other people, as I mentioned before, I think they have an attachment to things being certain ways and to the ways that they know things. And because the Wan episodes challenged what they already knew, there's an emotional reaction to that being that it's bad. I think all of those things are at play. Sripad Ganti asks, top 10 favorite characters from both? <sighs> there's just so many great characters to choose from. So this is just top of my head. I'll probably change my answers if asked again. But right now it's Toph, Bosco. <laughs> In no particular order, by the way, except top number one. Iroh, Zuko, Bolin, Korra, Varric, Cabbage Guy, Lin, and Sokka. All right, is that all right? Am I going to get in trouble for that? Probably. I'm sure I forgot someone really important. <laughs> the Godly Flame Sol Soliomana says, Who's the best character and why is it Tenzin? Well, it's Tenzin, and it's because his struggle is very relatable. Which set of characters did you enjoy watching more? I think I got to give it to the last airbender on this just because it was. I think it was a lot more cohesive. You had the gang. You had the villains, and you had Zuko, who's sort of like in between both worlds, and it's such a beautiful thing. And then you have Iroh as this like godlike figure just passing wisdom down from the mountaintop. Partis asks, do you think Korra's villains are better than those of The Last Airbender? Overall, I'd say 
Yes, except that I don't think anybody passes Azula for me. Abdul Sasei asks, who is funnier, Sokka or Varric? Sokka's humor, he walks that fine line between humor and annoyance. There's moments of he's hilarious and there's moments of I'm face palming. And so I love Sokka. But Varric, just like, I, there's just some lines, man, that I'll never forget. Why do you think I built this boat? <laughs> See, I'm still, I'm still laughing about it. I love Sokka, but sometimes he can be really corny. Manu.u asks, if they could make Legend of Korra as an overarching story, how would you want them to do that? The amazing thing is I think they did. I think that people talk about the fact that it was it's so disjointed. I think that they did their best given that. And I actually think it tells a coherent story about Korra and about the world. And the story is that the world is always developing. And that one solution leads to another challenge, and that's the story of humanity. And it's also a personal story, because in your life, the more you accomplish, the more challenges you have. It's never-ending. And so the question is, how do you find value in that struggle? And how do you find self-identity throughout a constant fluctuating universe and life? Shireen Kasim asks, I read a negative review about Korra that said it was using my nostalgia for The Last Airbender to make me watch it. Do you feel that way? Not at all. And in fact, I think it's the opposite of that. I think that the show creators are trying hard to distance themselves from the last airbender like they literally severed the connection to the past and i think that's their way of telling the audience like this is new you know this is not the last airbender and get over it but then they still use elements of it that work really well which series made you more sad that it ended and why i think i definitely felt more sadness when the last airbender ended just because it ends so perfectly and also there's more build up for that thing ending like there's more build up for ozai ending than like kuvira ending but also just personally it was also sort of like my development on YouTube. Like The Last Airbender was a major point for me in my life, just doing what I'm doing now. Like it's enabled me to get to this point. And so I remember when that show ended, I was very, very sentimental about that fact, you know, because before The Last Airbender started, and this is uh, maybe too personal than people want, I was kind of struggling, right? Like I had just come home from China. I'm separated from my girlfriend. I'm separated from my friends. It's the, the midst of like the initial stages of COVID hitting the US. I had changed my YouTube theme and it was not going well. And people were reacting really, really, really negatively to the videos I was making. And I was feeling unsure of myself. And so I had a couple of successes and The Last Airbender was like the thing that really launched this whole thing. And also through The Last Airbender, I started to become more myself. Like, I think before that, I was sort of trying to do like a more standard reaction format of like, whoa, you know, but that, but like, it was right before that for Midnight Gospel that I really started like expressing how I think. And, and The Last Airbender, you guys, basically in, in the comments, you encouraged me to share more about myself and more about my thoughts. And so that totally like, it was such a gift to be like, wow, I can like be myself doing this. You know, I can really, really enjoy the series in the way that I usually enjoy things and people appreciate that. And so the end of The Last Airbender was sort of this meta thing too. It wasn't just the show. It was like my life and my journey. I feel like I had turned a corner in some meaningful way. And so it, I remember I finished The Last Airbender and I was like legit like crying. Lolika asks, any hopes or thoughts regarding Netflix Avatar live action series? With the creators gone, not super pumped for it. I think a really good rule of thumb that's helped me enjoy so many things I otherwise would not have enjoyed is managing expectations. Like I really believe in the phrase, expect the worst, hope for the best. And this is no different. I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna expect it to be on the quality of the last airbender live action movie. And so if it's terrible, I'll be like, I was right. You know, and I'll get some satisfaction in that. And if it's great, I'll be like, whoa, that's amazing. You know, so that's been my philosophy for media since I was a teenager, I remember having this thought very distinctly, like I should always go into everything expecting nothing. Or if I do expect anything, expecting it to be bad because then I'll always be pleasantly surprised. And then at least, you know, I'll be open to it. It's like, right, let's see how it goes. After reading the last Airbender comics, who do you think Zuko ended up with? So this is really funny because the comics gave me a distinct impression that they were setting up Zuko and Suki. I don't know if that ever materialized. And I've heard that maybe the creators mentioned that May was canon, but it felt like at one point, at least they had different ideas for that. And I don't know, I could see going it anyway, honestly. Maram Abdullah said, if possible, which character do you want to be? Living their life, using their powers. Um, unsurprisingly, Toph. You can't go wrong, man. Like, she's such a maverick. She innovated bending forever. She had her own school. She was police chief. She was almost governor. She became enlightened. She had very successful kids. Nobody could touch her. Nobody ever broke her spirit. Toph, 100% Toph. Who would win in a fight? Varric with a boomerang or Sokka with Ping Ping the stuffed platypus bear? Sokka. Sokka is a strategist. If you were to change one thing about Legend of Korra, what would it be and why? I think I would probably spend a lot less time on romance and spend more time on character development. So I've been thinking about this a lot the last couple days because of the ending of season four and also the comics with Korra and Asami and why it's for some people a contentious thing. I really don't think it has anything to do with Korra and Asami being a bad pair. I think they're actually a really great pair and I think that the, it was pretty obvious to me 
sort of having an idea that they were going to end up together, that they laid the groundwork for that pretty clearly. I think the problem is just that romance is really hard to do well in shows, period. And I was trying to think of good examples of romance in shows that I like. And this is very strange, but one show that came to mind is actually Dragon Ball. Because the romance just sort of happens off screen. And it's like, okay, cool. Like, Bulma and Vegeta one day are together and have a kid. And it's like, all right, it works. We don't need to see the whole thing. You know, just, it's fine. They're together. That's how things happen in life, right? Like, as much as romance is dramatized and there's all this buildup and sexual tension, I feel like usually when there's that kind of tension and when there's that kind of confusion and ambiguity, that's when relationships typically don't work out. I mean, there are obviously exceptions, but for me, relationships that work, they just clicked immediately. And they happened so naturally. There was none of this, like, love triangle stuff and there's none of, like, will they, won't they? It's just like, I like you and you like me and chop chop. You know, we don't need to see everything. And also like Goku and Chi Chi, this is controversial, but Chi Chi sort of comes along and is like, Goku, we're going to get married. And Goku's like, all right, I guess. And then they're married. And then you have all this great lineage of their kids and it's so cool. But we don't really need to know why Chi Chi and Goku love each other or why they end up together. It's just they do and that's fine. And I sort of feel like Legend of Korra focused way too heavily on that. Let's say they even wanted to do Korra Mako and then have them break up and Korra Asami. It could have just happened off screen and I think it wouldn't have suffered one bit. In fact, I think it would have made the series better. Juriato L says, there are many who strongly believe Korra considered suicide when she stood by the cliff. I absolutely think that that's what they were implying. I think it was too on the nose for that to be a coincidence. And the thing that gives it away for me is she's literally standing over the cliff and you see her teardrop fall all the way down into the depths below. That's not an accident. That shot is telling you she's looking down at the cliff and feeling depressed. What else could that shot possibly mean? In a show like this where there's so few accidents, when they really give so much thought to the characters and to the events of the show, it's hard to believe they weren't implying suicide at that moment. Superino 3 asks, if all the villains sat down and had tea together, how would their interactions be? We got this. We got this in the phone call in the, in the, flat, in the recap episode. Unalak would not have a good time. He wouldn't be invited. He wouldn't be there. Even though the copyright was a pain in the butt. Thank you, Tirenda, for acknowledging that. Did you have a favorite music piece from the show? You know, I'm not that attuned to it to remember. When did I cry? That's probably when the music was the best. I guess the the, the flashback episode with Cora Tenzin. I don't remember the music, but I'm sure it was good if I was crying. What ship was your favorite? I'm, I'm just generally not a shipper, you know, like I just talked about romance. It's just not my thing. I don't really care. I think I definitely had the most fun with... Zutara, just because it was so much fun to like get people riled up, but I was never really invested in it. You know, okay, going back, so going back to the romance thing I just said about how it's best when there's not too much attention focused on it. You know what's my favorite ship, and this is like a weird thing? Saka Suki. It's great. They just like each other. They meet. They have some initial attraction. They're separated. Saka dates someone else. They meet again, and boom, they're a couple. That's, there was no like bells and whistles. It's just they like each other, and that's good enough. That's how things are. It was unoffensive, and so my favorite ship is... Saka, Saka, su, su, Saki, Suka, whatever. Zach Trejo says, were you disappointed we didn't see much about the Fire Nation? I didn't even think about this until I read the Kyoshi novels and I realized how much I missed the Fire Nation. Fairis Chandol asks, what do you think about the end of Amon and his brother? It was very emotional for me. I disagree with Tarlok's decision. I think that in keeping with the themes of the show, there's always potential. And I think Amon and him could have done great things. But then again, that's part of what makes it tragic. It's like, I didn't want it to happen, but it's very emotionally compelling, and so I appreciate it. What's your favorite episode? Oof. I'm pretty sure if I think about this later, this is going to be one of those things that I reverse, just when I remember more. Just right now, and probably because it's more one of the more recent ones, I'm going to say Korra alone. Ebag24 says, did Korra do well as an expansion of the series, or did it not need to be made? So first, I just really enjoyed it, so I'm glad it exists. But secondly, I think in some ways it actually gave context to some of the events of The Last Airbender, and so it's actually an enhancer. Peony says, shout out to my cat who turned four today. Shout out to your cat. Wolfie Games asks, least favorite character. Oof. This is going to be really controversial, I think. I can feel it. But one character who I feel like didn't develop, and also did things that sort of annoyed me, and also in a meta way created problems for me on the channel, is Opal. <laughs> I started off really liking her in season three. In season four, I sort of was irritated by her. And actually, the comic I just read made me feel that even more. Probably Ty asks, if you were an avatar, which element would you like to bend? This was settled for me by my sister who convinced me I'd be an earthbender, which works. I think that works. Adam Connolly asks, which character could you see yourself being friends with? I could see myself being friends with almost all of them. I mean, the kind of person I am, just looking at my actual life, my friends are really, really an eclectic mix of people. I think maybe I wouldn't get along with Opal. <laughs> I feel like Tenzin is somebody I would gravitate towards, but we would also clash. People I think I could really get along with, with no conflict at all, would be um, Bolin. I mean, who, could, who can't get along with Bolin, right? Mako? I think like Mako and I could have like a healthy friendship with like some personal space. Asami, I could definitely get along with very well. Varric? Varric and I would get into trouble. 
Eric's that kind of friend. Like you're real close, but you got to be wa- you got to watch out where that road leads you. You know, I have a lot of friends like that. Do you think you'll ever come across a show that's better than the two series? I hope so. I hope we get many more shows like this. There's not enough of them. I think there have been shows I've enjoyed as much as these shows. Uh, in terms of like life stuff though, I don't know. It's tough. There's a lot here. Super random one. I know you love animals. How would you name your pro bending team? Man, would it be cheating to say the lion turtles? I do love lion turtles. Not very creative though, is it? In all reality, I'd probably end up going corporate. My team would be like the Republic City Dr. Peppers. Bean Guy asks, would you rather have Eric's good looks and smarts or have Bolin's humbleness and strength? I mean, I got it all. <laughs> well, there goes humility. Humility out the window. I'm also not very strong these days. I'll take Barrick, especially because he becomes a pretty decent guy over time. You know, he actually has a conscience. Also, I'm leaning that way because I'm already a lot more similar to Varric, and so it feels more natural. Bolin is just like, he's too good for me. Uh, I'm just not that good. I try to be that good. I have my moments. Tariq Thomas asks, what are some lessons from Corey you think will resonate with people? The first is letting go. I think we all have these ideas of ourselves and who we are that's not realistic, and it's only by going out into the world and challenging ourselves and questioning our core beliefs that we can allow ourselves to crash and then, re- and then be rebuilt stronger. And I think this is a uh, a very long and constant process of self-development. I think a lot of people can really relate to the idea of being stuck and that state creating massive internal conflict because something just isn't right. Like the way I'm thinking about myself in the world just isn't right. And that's where a lot of pain comes from. And so it's allowing that pain to happen, right? Allowing that to, to enter and to really looking at it. Like what's the truth? You know, who am I really? Maybe I'm not all that I, I think I am or all that I want to believe I am. Maybe there are challenges I could take on that would make me better even if they were painful. To me, that's something that's really beautiful and endlessly relevant. And the other thing is, how do you cope with pain? I think one essential and unavoidable part of the process I just described is massive pain because it's really painful to disrupt yourself like that and to actually shine a light on yourself and who you really are and what you're capable of. You know, it's like this purifying fire you're putting yourself through. It burns. But the question is, how do you see that struggle? And I think one way to look at it is that is it is that that struggle is a temporary state towards hopefully something better like we tend to over identify with the moment of pain and we think like this pain is just what life is or i'm terrible because i'm experiencing pain but i think that there's an important long term perspective that gives that pain meaning and that question is what does this pain mean why do i have this pain what is it trying to tell me and how can I use this to become a better person? And I think for me, that's a very motivating message. Elena Wesley asks, do you like the connection so the past avatars was severed? I kind of did. I kind of did. I think it works on multiple levels. Like one, it raises the stakes for Korra. She's all alone now. It also was part of the lore that I that I had problems with in The Last Airbender. Like I didn't appreciate Roku. I appreciate him more now that I realize he was not supposed to be depicted as perfect, that he was flawed and that um, each avatar has their own and different and imperfect visions of what the world should be. But yeah, I, I always felt like the, the previous avatars were misleading Aang or like weren't that helpful. So I sort of liked that, that Korra had to, you know, put that on her own shoulders. I'm a big fan of that theme in general, which you probably have noticed. Like I like the idea of looking at a personal challenge, looking at what you yourself have control over and then taking that responsibility onto yourself and trying to make that thing better. That's something that will always, always, always resonate with me. But also on this sort of meta level, it's kind of the shows telling people like, forget about The Last Airbender a little bit, you know, to a certain extent. It's like, this is its own thing. Treat it as its own thing. And I think that's the correct message for Korra. And I think that's the correct way to approach Korra. Jonathan asks, do you feel as though The Last Airbender characters got enough screen time in Korra? Yes, I would have liked to see more of Zuko or, and also I would have liked to have at least one scene where Zuko kicks ass. I feel like they mishandled the scene where Zaheer escapes. Zuko had to lose, but I wish he had kicked more ass just to honor his legacy. Infinite Zodiac asks, do you think the mechs fit the Avatar world? Yeah, I think it fits because one of the themes is modernization. Not the mechs alone, but just the overall theme of technology. You know, that's a, lo- a large part of where Korra draws its conflict. Sembi says, you can spend a day with one character. Who and why Varric? It would be Varric and it would be Varric because, uh, well, pre-marriage Varric. I feel like I want to hang out with Varric as a bachelor. And in this scenario, I'm also a bachelor. I think in my younger days, Varric and I would have gotten along real well. Which season of Legend of Korra do you enjoy the most? So I don't think, have I ranked the seasons yet? I don't think I have. This is going to be weird. This is even weird for me right now thinking about this. I'm actually going to say season one. I think that in many ways, it's the most coherent season. There are lots of twists. I love Aman. I love that Aman not only makes a compelling case, but has really compelling reasons underneath the surface that felt really true to life to me. I also feel like the tone of season one was its own thing. 
there's some like really kind of futuristic cyberpunk scenes you know with Amon's henchmen and stuff like that there are also a bunch of twists the ending is very very um dramatic and emotionally compelling i think they rushed Korra's development and her reflection on who she really is and later seasons kind of picked up that slack but um yeah i, lo- I love season one and a very very close second almost maybe even a tie is season four just because of Korra's journey i think what brought down season four a little bit was that Kuvira was sort of rushed or Kuvira didn't have the depth necessary to make it as good as the other seasons. The best villain in the show I think is Zaheer and season three is awesome because of him and also because of the air nomads. Maybe season three is my favorite. I don't know this is hard but also if I recall correctly season three starts out slow. This is just my gut feeling. I don't even really remember what happens in the beginning. Take this with a major pillar of salt. Just my ranking right now at this moment without having time to reflect on this series or watch it again is season one, season four, season three, season two. There it is. Jess S. asks, with what you know about all the avatars, what do you think the next avatar would be like? Uh, Earth avatar, I think that he might have to focus a lot on the Earth Kingdom, because the Earth Kingdom seems a little bit messed up. He'd also have to bring into balance the spirit world and the human world, and even more than Korra, have to try to figure out, like, what is the avatar's purpose anymore? What past avatar is your favorite? I gotta say, um, besides the main ones, I gotta say Kyoshi, just because I love the book so much. Has the avatar depression kicked in yet? Yes. Paradigm asks, do you think Lin had a right to be mad at Suyin? I think she had understandable reasons to be mad at Lin. Um, I think overall it was good that she got over it. I think she was looking at it as a snapshot in time and carrying that across her whole life, and I think it was good that she got over that. Because Suyin obviously had a lot of growth too, and she changed a lot. Who is the strongest bender in the series and why Milo? <laughs> well, it was Milo. <laughs> and it's because even though he's so young, he has so much potential. But honestly, in all the series, I'm going to give it to Iroh. Because Iroh has that quality that I think some characters have. I feel the same way about Master Roshi in Dragon Ball, where their level of power rises to the occasion. And a lot of it comes from their inner power. So they're able to cope with things better. There's like a there's like a thematic message there, right? Like, if you are wise, if you are good and strong, you get a multiplier on your powers, I think. Emilio Turan asks, what are your thoughts about Rava's and Vatu's design? So I guess they're controversial and people call them kites. Even the show referred to them as kites. When I saw them, I thought of like viruses or bacteria, which is kind of cool and it fits into this like ancient kind of primordial vibe. YmenH24 asks, what symbolism can you give about Korra as a whole? There's a lot, but I'd say like big things, as I've talked about a little bit already, are um, see pain as a part of growth. Don't get stuck in pain. Use pain and use challenges to define your life and how you're going to carry yourself going forward and in the strive to become a better, more complete human being. Another big one is letting go. Let go of your assumptions about the world and let go of your assumptions about yourself and actually go out into the world and try to do the things you want to do and learn from those things openly without rejecting them or without being overly hard on yourself. Life is a long process of trial and error and you're not even going to allow yourself to go out into the world if you're afraid of the error, you know? And if you're afraid of the trial, that's just part of the package. And I think that it should be loved in its own way, even as terrible as our lows can be, you know? Giving it that context, giving it that meaning in the whole of our lives and looking at how we, you know, how we can use them and how we're always growing and and having faith that you can be better and that life can be better and that you can achieve things you want to achieve and that you can be a positive force in the world. I think makes those things more manageable. And another thing is that society is always moving and changing. And I think that the long-term prognosis on that is good. The world is naturally chaotic and dangerous and in many ways horrifying. And so it's reasonable to be patient with ourselves and be patient with society and take a long-term view and see that where we are now did not develop in a vacuum. It was hard fought and it was, it came with a lot of tragedy and it came with a lot of hard work. And I think We're now not at the end of the journey like we feel, you know, like in many ways, this is just the beginning of the journey. Everything we accomplish will will raise a new challenge and it's this endless process. And so the only thing you can do is just do your best in it. And I think things will only really radically improve if we accept that life is impermanent and that society is by definition impermanent and that um, we all as individuals are imperfect, but that we have to do our best anyway to be more honest, um, more open, kinder human beings who actively focus on making things better in a way that's not destructive or hateful or anything like that. And also to be aware of people's agendas. Like many of these villains are really good at gaining support with the people they need support from by appealing directly to the heart and they end up doing terrible things in the name of greatness. And that to me is so real. It's like you can't just trust someone because they have something that on the surface looks desirable. There's almost always more to it than that. The world is such a complex place and I think it does us a disservice 
to boil really complex issues into black and white issues where there's a good guy and a bad guy. You know, like these shows are so good at painting a nuanced portrait of even their villains to the point where the villains all have at least something to offer. You know, they have some idea to contribute. And I think it's by really being a fluid person and looking at things very openly and not rejecting people or ideas outright, but looking through them, having a pure mind, a pure heart that can't be corrupted by poison, right? Actually diving into them and extracting what actually is good from that, what actually is true from that, and then incorporating that into your being and then trying to be a better person because of that. Does that make sense? There are a lot of people out there who want us to fall into easy answers. And I think that embracing nuance, you know, embracing nuance of humanity, embrace, embracing nuance and ideas, I think is one way, one thing people can do at the individual level right now within themselves that they have control over that would affect the world in a meaningful and beneficial way. Asher1347 asks, what did you think of how Lion Turtles granted bending? I don't think it was inconsistent with the story. I think you can have Lion Turtles create bending, but then still have people learn bending later from the animals that first had that ability. So for me, that's not a hole in the lore. There's a difference between the two things. One is innate ability and one is learning the learning of the art. You can maybe make sort of a weak comparison to life where like the lion turtles granting bending abilities would be something that's like DNA, right? So you're either, either born with it or you're not. But even if you have innate abilities for things, you don't become good at those things unless you learn them. And so people who are able to bend thanks to the lion turtles still have to learn this from something. And so you can learn it from badger moles or whatever. Hmm, says, what were your favorite moments? All the later interactions with Tenzin and Korra, those were especially moving to me. Zaheer flying is up there. Korra alone, that whole episode. The appearance of Toph made me really happy. Some of Varric's jokes in season two. Eska and Bolin's relationship was a huge, huge point of humor for me. Bolin lava bending, there are so many, there are so many. Jamie Morgan says, are you ready to admit that you're in love with Bolin? I've admitted it many times. I'm not afraid to admit that. I love Bolin, he's the best. Gabriel E asks, top three fight scenes from Legend of Korra. Uh, Zaheer definitely up there. The final fight was Zaheer. I love the battle at Zaofu. All right, so I'm gonna stop it there. I'm sorry if I missed your question. I've tried to cover broadly most of the questions and question types. Thank you to everybody who's asked. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for following this Korra journey. This is gonna be probably the last Korra video for now. I know I've said it before, but I can't help myself but say it again. From the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody who has made Korra so special. And hopefully this is not the end of the Avatar journey. There are still new installments coming out via the comics and through novels and things like that. And who knows, maybe one day we'll get a third Avatar series, which would be hopefully amazing. So hopefully I'll see you for that. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you for Dragon Prince and Full Metal Alchemist, which will start next week. So I'll see you there.